Welcome to The Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. How's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle Podcast. Jamie Eads joining you as I do each and every week. This is episode 155. Hope everybody's having a great week out there, enjoying some spring-like weather finally. Uh, It is springtime here in the Bluegrass State. We're enjoying it quite a lot. Uh, Lots of stuff going on personally with the family. Um, so I've been really, really busy and I apologize for not having, uh, regular, uh, episodes, but we're going to try to get back in the groove here. We've got a great episode today. Uh, I'm going to be joined once again by just one of my favorite human beings. Uh, the great Mark Poise will be joining us again right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at LosCabosDrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, as I mentioned, we're going to be joined by our good friend Mark Poise here in just a second. We're going to be talking about... Uh, the big three. It's a new program that he's doing um, to help folks, you know, kind of move up the ladder uh, in the entertainment business. And, you know, if you recall, the last time we had Mark on, uh, which was, you know, kind of right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, he was working uh, towards becoming a a coach, uh, a certified coach. Um, and he's been doing some of that stuff. Of course, he's still out on the road with Tyler Farr, uh, taking care of all kinds of business. And he became a dad uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so lots of cool stuff going on in Mark's world. And I, I just can't say enough great things about him. Um, you know, we've known each other now for probably five or six years, and he truly is just one of the great guys in this business. Uh, I tell him all the time, he is one of my favorite human beings, and that is a true statement. Um, he's just he's just here to help. That is what Mark is all about. If you need something, uh, just say the word, and Mark is your guy. So uh, I think this is Mark's uh, third or fourth uh, visit with us, and it's always fun. And I know you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. Uh, so please help me welcome back to the Drum Shuffle podcast, Mark Poise. Hey, good afternoon, Mark. How's it going, brother? Hey, Jamie. I'm I'm doing well, uh, all things considered. Sick toddler today, but um, home and can help take care of her. So that's a win. Um, how are you, man? But man, I, I can't complain a bit. Um, doing well, you know, just, uh, we're on opposite ends of the parenting spectrum, you know, and, and I, I think we've talked about that a little bit, you know, we've been doing, uh, college visits and, uh, you know, college ballet auditions for the last couple of months. So, 
Uh, my daughter's about to uh, embark on her college career and, and you've got a toddler at home. So, um, you know, sometimes I wish I could rewind that clock. Other times I'm like, I'm glad that's Mark and not Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, they. I, I know it will feel like I blink and that comes and yet it feels you know, with the diapers, it feels so far away. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, um, the, the, you you will remember the day. Uh, trust me, you will remember the day you throw the diaper pail away, and you will you will <laughs> celebrate that day in perpetuity. Oh man, no, I, I love it. I love that she's doing so well too, though. Um, I've only had two years of that par- uh, parental celebration joy that you get when they have milestones. So. Uh, I'm sure that it's just awesome to get to see what you're seeing now with her. Yeah, it it really is, man. And it's, you know, we talked a little bit before we uh, started the interview officially here. You know, there's, I think the lens changes. Um, at least it has for me. Like I used to see things, you know, just only through my own eyes and my own perspective um, with a lot of help and guidance of my wife, you know, I mean, we, we talked about, you know, our goals as a married couple and and things like that. But now I I have found that like all I can really do at this point with, with my daughter is give the best advice I can because she's an adult, she's 18. And it, it just, I don't know. It's different when you get to this point, if that makes any sense. Oh, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. And probably that much more gratifying and terrifying at the same time. In, indeed. But, you know, I'm sure you had talks with your parents, you know, um, and we've gotten into this in some of our past conversations, you know, on the podcast. But, you know, hey, I really want to chase this music thing. And, you know, that look that you get from your parents, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you tell yeah. them that. Let's talk about a backup plan conversation. It, it, yes. <laughs> that, the, yes, that conversation. But, you know, I mean, my daughter is, you know, a, a pre-professional ballet student, and she really wants to chase the world of professional ballet, which, unlike the music industry, your career might last 15 years if you're lucky. Because, you know, they are, you know, ballet dancers are really very much like NFL players. You know, your, your body just can't take that wear and tear for a prolonged period of time. So we have the backup conversation a lot. And it's just, you know, it, it's different, right? When you get to this point, yeah. you can only give the best input possible. And ultimately, your kids are going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and someone who's really passionate about a career that could potentially be ending that much sooner, it's almost like condensing life because everyone has this transition into retirement that's going to happen at some point, but she might be facing that in her twenties or thirties. And then there's going to be an evolution from there. And, and, you know, some people come out of that and they thrive even more than ever before. And, and some people end up sort of being a shell of their former selves. And there's so many factors for that, but also opportunities for giving that guidance, you know, as a father, as a mentor, as, as someone with just life wisdom for, you know, like yourself. So, um, it, it, it's such a fascinating thing when people are drawn to careers and lines of work that are, you know, call it front loaded athletes are the same way, you know? Yeah. I I mean, I think the biggest difference is, you know, NFL athletes, you know, I think the league minimum now is like $1.75 million per year in ballet. I think it's about $6,000 per year. So oh, yeah. Just like playing music, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, you're, you're going to have the shortened career of an NFL athlete, but you're going to make the money of a drummer. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Oh, but she, she is going to do okay, man. I have no doubt that whatever, whatever her ballet career becomes, it's going to set her up for the next act really well too. Uh, it doesn't have to be a leave this for that. It's, it's just a springboard each time. That's if I've learned anything in my own path, it's been that, you know, um, things aren't disjointed. They're actually integrated. 
Yeah, with it, that, and that's very true, you know. But um, you know, I I could go on and wax poetic about this for hours because it's just where I'm at in my life right now. But you know, the last time you and I did this, you know, for the audience, so to speak, you know, as as an official episode of the podcast. I think it was right in the middle of kind of everything being shut down because of the COVID pandemic, Um, touring, you know, all the tour buses were parked someplace, you know, getting their engines and transmissions serviced, (laughs) you know, there wasn't a whole lot going on and you were working your way through your, um, you know, certifications for coaching. And, yeah. you know, I think we, we, we may have actually announced that on the podcast, which I'm, I'm grateful to you for. But, you know, since that time, obviously, um, you and the wife have had a child. Um, you know, the world has kind of opened back up a little bit. Did you see a lot of transition over the past, you know, two and a half, three years? Or is it still pretty much business as usual? It's it's funny. Um, I, I feel like I need to say, even though you raised it, is it this or is it that? I feel like I have to say yes to both. I got gotcha. you. Um, it's it's business as usual in the sense that uh, I'm actually on the same road gig. Uh, I'm still playing with Tyler Farr, country music artist. Um, you know, there's a few guys in that team camp that have been there for years and years now. Um, and still live in the same place in Nashville and, and still doing the occasional session work and all that. And then in other parts of my life, it is, you know, like you alluded to completely different, um, have a beautiful two year old girl now. Um, and the coaching thing has, has blossomed in a way in my life and found its way into like nooks and crannies of what I do, uh, in ways that I never expected when I started that whole journey. Um, and, I think for the, for all of us, we look back on the pandemic time and whether we call it good or, or whether we call it bad, I think everyone can just say like, this was pivotal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and things shifted. And in many cases, things don't tend to unshift. They just keep evolving, uh, from there. So for me, it's sort of, especially now as touring has really picked back up. It's funny because it's a familiar thing and yet it's completely new because I'm embracing a new balance as I'm doing it. Um, sort of in a space of having two careers now in, in a, in a legitimate way, uh, something I never envisioned or really thought was possible. And yet when you're doing the right things for yourself, things kind of, they find their right time slot and you find the energy and the, the motivation and concentration. Um, and the same applies to being a parent, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> when, before you have kids, you're like, I don't have any more energy. And then you have kids and, and you're like, I'm doing five times as much and I still don't have more energy, but somehow it all gets done. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the the interesting thing. And a lot of the, you know, guys and gals that I've talked to that, that did go through, you know, I, obviously all of us went through the pandemic, but you know, the, the folks that were really relying on the road income, right. The, the, the touring gigs, everybody just found a way to pivot into something else. You, you always find a way to make it work. Um, you know, and I think it's different for everybody. You know, some people, you know, was, you know, driving Uber eats or, you know, working at Lowe's or whatever the case may be. You know, I, I had um, Jamie Wallum from Tears for Fears on. He started running a lumber mill, <laughs> you know, like he became the yeah. boss of a lumber mill. And that's that's amazing to me. Um, so I, I guess we all went through some sort of transition in there. Um, I, I guess you might have a unique perspective in that you started coaching folks around that time. So were you helping people to, to navigate through that pivot? Uh, A lot of times. Yeah. Although not just musicians, well, certainly not just drummers, but not even just musicians or entertainers. Um, When we would have talked last, I was, um, I would still call it in the early stages of a coaching career. Um, And the pandemic you know, to, to put it in a positive light, the pandemic provided the opportunity to go further with, um, you know, 
immersive training certifications experience building um all of that than I ever expected in the beginning because I just said, well, I, I'm the type of guy who wants to be doing something. I like being active. I like working towards something. Um, so I just um, treated it like an opportunity to do that, uh, hard as it was to, to not be out on the road playing. Um, and the funny thing was that's what I needed to sort of discover what it could become for me because it actually opened a door to the corporate world. Um, and, and within about a year, a little over a year, I was operating as a coach contracted with big companies that I never would have ever dreamed that I would be having conversations with, um, you know, like leaders, uh, new leaders and director VP level people at, at companies like, um, like Capital One and IBM and AT&T. And, you know, you would think, what is a drummer talking to these people for? <laughs> but, um, I had to, I had to have the opportunity to realize that I had these other skill sets that were valuable and I was able to, you know, given the time, uh, and maybe even desperation, a little amount of desperation to give myself credit there in early 2020, um, to realize you can be more than one thing. Um, and that was really cool because I think if we can broaden that perspective of ourselves, then we can find out what we really do have to offer instead of boxing ourselves in. Like, I think, um, I think so many of us, when we're young, we want to do that. We just put ourselves in a box. I'm a drummer or, or worse yet. Like I'm this kind of drummer. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just opening up and being like, what are all the things I have to offer? What are the, all the different places that these could be applied? Um, and I think you get to see that with, you know, someone taking it to a lumber mill and somebody taking it to, uh, even something that doesn't seem like a big deal, like driving for Uber. Um, but man, you know, a good Uber driver has good social skills. <laughs> yeah. If you ask me, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, oh, for if you sure. ask me, I've had some bad ones. Um, so I, I think for everybody, you have that opportunity to do it. And the pandemic in some cases forced us out of our comfort zone. And then we start looking sometimes based on need for things. And you end up discovering things about yourself you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. And, you, you know, you, you talk about, well, what does a drummer have to offer to corporate America? You know, corporate America had to change during the pandemic as well. You know, and I've, yeah, you, you know, I've never hidden the fact that, you know, throughout my musical journey, my career in music, I have always had a day job because I had to, right? I mean, that's how you pay the bills. Um, in my world, because I've never toured on the same level as you or, or you know, so many of our friends, um, you know, and, and I work in a corporate setting and, you know, that was completely different. It was like, OK, go home. You know, this job that you've been doing for the last 20 years that we t told you could not be done from home. We lied. You have to do it from home now. Right. So. Mm -hmm just these monumental shifts of how everything worked during that time. And I think it really forced, as you say, everybody to look at what box am I in? What corner have I painted myself into? And does it really have to be? There was a lot of, you know, existential questions asked amongst every individual. And I, I find that really interesting. Oh, yeah, because you, you, sometimes we have to get shaken up to realize even that we put ourselves in a box. Like bef before we even talk about breaking out of it, it's like I'd never realized I was in a box before. Yeah. Well, who put me here? Well, I put myself here because I just always assumed I was here. Um, and and that, that pandemic moment of realizing, you know, hey, do things have to be this way? Maybe not. And, and certainly I don't, I don't want to brush over that there were some very difficult aspects of it as well, up to and including, you know, people dying. Um, but with every challenge, whether it's bigger or smaller, it's like it give, brings a, a change in perspective. Um, and I think for some people it was that existential change in perspective of like, you know, losing people close to them. And that causes people to look at their life differently. But in other cases, it's just saying work from home instead of in the office. And people start looking at a commute and realizing how wasteful it was. Or uh, musicians that realize that they could, they could enjoy a life that doesn't only consist of 
playing. Um, that's liberating, I think. Uh, but if you would have told them that before the pandemic, they probably wouldn't have believed you. Yeah. I mean, how many of our buds, you know, for the first time in their adult lives unpacked in 2020? <laughs> You know, it probably took me uh, out of three months to unpack my bag. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that was a, a mourning process of realizing what a long haul we were in for. Because um, I have a bag that always stays about half packed. You know, the, the, the main stuff is in there and just the, cl- the clothes, dirty clothes come out and clean clothes go in. Um, but yeah, that was like a symbolic gesture, mm-hmm. uh, putting that empty bag into the closet where it truly belongs. Yeah, man. I mean, but I mean, just so many of of my friends, it was the first time in 20, 30 years that they had unpacked, you know, the bunk bag. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it just crazy to me. But, you know, and, and I, again, I could go on and on about how interesting all of this was for the music industry. But th- that that's not what we're here to talk about. You know, I, I was just really trying to catch up with you a little bit. But You know, now that, you know, touring has kind of started back up, it's different a little bit, I think, um, in that you don't just leave and go away forever, right, for six months or whatever, more, you know, shorter runs and things for a lot of artists. Um, How is that going? I know you guys just started um, kind of a package tour last week. Um, You know, how are things in the on the touring front for you? It feels like, um, from, from my point of view, 2023 is finally stepping back toward a normal, um, being in Nashville and touring in the country scene. We've always had a sort of weekend warrior approach. Like even a full schedule would involve, you know, maybe you're playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday night shows and you're getting home on Sunday and you're leaving on Wednesday. Uh, or some variant, you know, rhyming with that. And that was what drew me to Nashville years ago. Um, it's actually been 10 years that I've lived here. Wow. Um, that's, that's why I ended up in Nashville over LA because I knew I wanted to have, uh, some semblance of a normal home life. Um, I recognize it's not completely normal, but (laughs) you know, some semblance of of a a family life. Um, so this actually feels like a step back to normal. You know, we've been out doing three show runs. You know, you get home and, you know, for me, the transition is how much home life has changed professionally and personally. Um, but out on the road, it's like, wow, this is how it used to feel. Um, wow. <laughs> we, Cause we didn't have that in 21 or 22, at least, uh, in my experience, it was sort of still chaotic, but now it feels like we, we all got our, our sea legs back in a way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hoping, hoping fingers crossed that we can continue that, you know, keep the good parts of what existed pre pandemic. And, um, you know, on the Tyler Farr gig, you know, nothing, nothing's really changed for me, I guess, you know, it, it's, I think just more gratitude around getting to show up in a city and play drums, which I love to do for a lot of people, which is awesome you know, to, to get to go into a big room and, and just like slap that kick drum for a sound check. I think there's more gratitude associated with that once again, than um, it, it being mundane, like it can be after you're grinding for year after year after year. Um, so that's the biggest thing is just having that, that gratitude back, but getting back into a sense of normal, um, that Nashville flow that, you know, that's, I, I feel like has always worked pretty well for the, the touring musicians out of Nashville. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, and, you know, and I don't know if you guys did any of the goofy kind of, you know, drive in shows during the pandemic and, you know, the the back porch, (laughs) you know, kind of things like (laughs) like we had all that stuff up here and it was just weird. I mean, I don't I there's no other word for it. It was just weird. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't do so many, we never did like a drive-in theater. Like I know those were a big thing. We never did those. We did some, some unique spots that you wouldn't consider a venue, but we were playing a show at, and we definitely did our fair share of awkward streaming spots um, where, you know, you show up, you want it to feel like it should feel, but it just doesn't feel that way. (laughs) Yeah. Cause you're playing into an empty, 
empty room with cameras, right? I mean, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at least, but at least in TV, if, if you're doing tele, live television, there's there's a certain urgency about it. Um, but so many people were doing stream things at, at that point, you know, mid pandemic that it was just, everyone was just kind of running around like, what are we doing? (laughs) (laughs) And, and it's, it's hard, it's hard to deliver the same sort of like focused, passionate performance in that environment because we haven't been connected to it. You know, you, uh, in our case, sometimes it would be, Hey guys, we haven't, we haven't seen each other or played a note in eight weeks. Yeah. Um, let's, let's do this. <laughs> and that's, that's sort of, you know, it's like having a relationship where you've may, maybe been on the rocks for a long time and you're just supposed to rekindle it immediately. Like it doesn't always work out, uh, ideally, but, um, you know, we, we all had to do whatever we could, but definitely, man, it just feels so good to get back in, in just some big rooms and a nice big PA and play drums in ways that feel awesome. Um, that's why I play. I love, I play because I love to play. Yeah. Um, and, and being able to do that more regularly once again is, you know, there's just a lot of gratitude coming back with that. Yeah. I hear you, man. And you know, I, I don't want to get too far inside baseball here and I don't want to let any, anybody's secrets out or anything, but I know that you spend a lot of your, um, shall I say show time, chasing Tyler around. He, he likes to do some improv and some, uh, um, you know, I, I know you have to chase him a little bit, you know, he's as, a man that doesn't want to be tied down. Yeah. C- c- correct. So <laughs> musically, musically, y- c- correct. So, you know, I, you and I talked and, and we were talking about this. Uh, it was gosh, going on four years ago that I came to one of your shows, you were here in Lexington and uh, came out for sound check. Thank you so much for you know so graciously you know providing tickets and all that stuff. But you know you were like, yeah, man, I I, I chase him around a lot during the show. You know, I, little things like that. You have to get back into that groove, and you're like, I'm never going to complain about that ever again, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. and- and you know, it's funny because as much as as a drummer, I'd say, oh, it feels this way for me coming back. I have to, you've got to leave that space because the artists feel the same way. Yeah. And, you know, he, he he's the same person he's always been, but there's every, every one of us grew and evolved or changed in some way through this, you know, that shared experience. So I, he's not, I'm not chasing him in the same way as I was before. Uh, and I need to observe, you know, just like keenly be observing um, but also it's that fascination of like, wow, this is the next stage of evolution of this thing that we do together. Yeah. Man. Um, and, and it, it's just cool because it's like, if you're away from your kids for, for, in my case, three days, I come back, I'm like, oh, she looks so different. She's grown so much. Well, if you're away from your gig for that long, you come back and you're like, wow, this is so different. <laughs> he, he, exactly. And that's where the juice is, right? I mean, that's where we grow and evolve is in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so it, it's, it just, it's amazing to me at how, how different yet how much similarity there is in those two periods of time. And I, you know, I think we're all going to look back, you know, 50 years from now, a hundred years from now, when we're no longer here and people are going to be like, yeah, this was a big turning point for everything and everybody. It's just, it's fascinating to me, I guess. And, and I get, I get down in that rabbit hole. So I apologize for derailing our entire interview on that stuff, but. Oh no, it's, it's all right, man. I mean, that's, that's the biggest shared experience of uh, probably human history. Right. So, yeah. um, I think it makes perfect sense that, that we, we all could get into those conversations. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, so I, I'm going to transition here just a little bit, you know, um, we talked a little bit about the, the coaching stuff that you've been doing, but I, I want to lean into this course that you've created. Um, and you know, First and foremost, I know you don't like being like some, you know, here, I'm here to sell something and I'm going to market this stuff to you. So, so I'll let you off the hook on that. I'm not going to force you to do that, but 
<laughs> you're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, I mean, I, I get it because I don't like to do it either, but you've created something here that I think is really, it's really unique and it's very cool. Um, but you've created this course called the big three, uh, steps to the big stage. And yes, the way I understand it is it, it's kind of part, you know, self study, you know, video course and part, you know, coaching with you for folks, you know, h- how to, you know, move up that next rung of the ladder, so to speak. Those are my words, not yours. Um, but it, Kind of give me a brief overview if I if I haven't already screwed that up of sure no of, no of what absolutely. you've created here. So um, the the coaching thing that we had alluded to, you know, our, our last conversation that, that people heard if they heard it, and then also the little bit we've said already. Um, the pandemic offered me the opportunity to just go further with that than I really expected to go originally. And I got involved, like I said, with, with the corporate world. And that was um, often a very humbling experience, but I, I love learning. So I learned a ton and I still am because I, I still do that. Um, and I always thought as a drummer, one of the things that I wanted in my career, I wanted to be one of those players that is really helping other people, whether that looks like a clinic thing or a masterclass thing um, or a speaking thing, I didn't know how it would look. And I always figured that, you know, the the moment would just like hit me on the head when it should come. But, um, I realized at a certain point that I had the tools to offer something that hadn't been offered and that was needed. So that's what the course is in a nutshell. It's, it's the, the, the playing career and the coaching experience combined. Um, and I realized that, the person I'm speaking to is, is my former self in a way. Uh, when you're like, Hey man, I, I've got all these skills. I've got all this tool set. How do I get to the next level? What does that actually require? How, how close am I? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. what do I need to do next? Or, or is this really just a lottery where, you know, you never know what could happen and some people are lucky and some people aren't, uh, which I don't agree with that last part, by the way. Um, so what I, what I created was basically uh, leveraging a breakdown of insights from both sides, but then structuring it in a way that is measurable for people, uh, a systematic way to assess where an individual is and where they need to improve. What, what is my next step? What is the thing that will pay off the most for me to focus on from here? Maybe it's just today or maybe it's this month or this year as a whole. Um, and that's, that's what I realized was different because you can hear everybody. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of great speakers, especially in the world of drummers um, that give like captivating clinics and keynotes and things. And they're about their experience and their insights and their path and all of that. Um, but there's nobody who's really laying out a thing that says, by the end of this, you will know for yourself what your next step on your path is. Because no one's path has ever been the same, you know, as, as much as it would be cool to be able to, to follow in the steps of, of this person or that person, none of us ever can. Right. Right. So, um, I, I did basically broke it down into, I realized that there's three core components. Um, and I don't, I don't go around saying them a lot because the fear is that people will hear how simple they are and think that the whole thing's easy. Yeah. I I don't Um, need this. Right. (laughs) uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but for, for people that are listening, I don't mind sharing them. The, the whole picture for being at a higher level as a player is you got to play the part. You need to look the part and you need to be a good person. And if you can check all three of those off, it's a matter of time until bigger opportunities come your way. Um, now those break down into lots of smaller components and you can actually measure those components and you can assess them. And by leveraging those assessments, then you can get new awareness about what do I need to do next? Where are my shortcomings? Um, or maybe I'm already there and I'm actually just, it's a matter of time, which means I just need to sustain this effort, you know, hold the course for a while. Um, that was something that I realized could be really valuable, mostly because I thought about how valuable it would have been to me. Um, 
you know, if you go back to my like late teens, early twenties, all this angst around wanting to have a performing career. I mean, maybe like what your daughter's thinking about ballet career right now. I'm not sure. I don't know how similar they actually are, but it's almost like, well, how do I get to the success that I want? Um, and I just wanted to create something that could really help people close that gap instead of getting on a camera and saying, Hey, this is how I did it. This is my story. I don't want to tell anyone you should be like me. That's not true. We need to figure out every individual. What is playing the part, looking the part and being a good person involved for us. And how do you measure it? You know, that that's where my sort of co corporate coaching experience comes into play is learning how to measure these things properly. Uh, you know, sometimes you could look at an element and say, Oh, I know where I'm at, but then the people around you might disagree. Um, so combining all that experience and trying to create something that is just super systematic and let someone know that by the end of this, as long as you do it right, you can close the gap a significant amount between where you are and where you want to be. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, I think that's, it's not as simple as saying to somebody like, like the old school way is, well, Mark, you know, if you really want to make it in this business, lock yourself in your bedroom and do paradiddles at 240 BPM for 17 hours a day. Right. I mean, that's, you know, you got to be the best player on your instrument or whatever the case may be. And that's not mm -hmm. really true because how many monster players do you know that aren't out on the road? touring because they don't want to, or because they'd rather spend their time doing something else, or, you know, they're a terrible hang on the bus, you know, the, the, yeah. the be a good person part. I mean, so I, I think it is different for everybody. Um, you know, I, I guess everybody has a different hurdle that they have to get over to make it to that next step. And, you know, yeah. you and I have talked about this before, you know, some people lack, you know, basic self-awareness, you know, they're either terribly underconfident in their abilities, like people that are like, oh, I'm not good enough to play in a band. And they're, you know, the best guitarist in town or, you know, the opposite of that is they think they're the best guitarist in town, but they, you know, can't play a simple wedding reception gig, you know, without getting drunk or in a fight with the bass player or what, you know, so many different scenarios I could lay out here. Yeah. And, and then there's the networking piece. There are some people that just simply don't like to talk about themselves to other people. Right. And, and they don't say, Hey, I'm available. Call me if you, you know, if you need to fill in for a week or two weeks and that always seems to build into something bigger if you do a good job, right? So what do you see as, you know, some of the common hurdles that musicians have to get to that next level? I think you hit the, the nail on the head really early on with what you were just stating that about self-awareness. Um, and I don't just mean self-awareness in a way that's mentioned in other circles, but how to actually knowing where they stand in every relevant way, which goes like you alluded to far beyond the chops. Um, the, the awareness E is really, that's the most important part of coaching. I, I think coaching gets a bad rap because a lot of, um, a lot of non-qualified people will think that they can just run around telling people what to do, but action isn't really the magical nugget. The magical nugget is new awareness. And, players or musicians in general that lack the awareness of where they stand in the most important ways are completely stuck because they don't know. And doing what somebody else did isn't necessarily going to get them somewhere that they want to be because what that person did was what that person needed. And the, you know, each of us has our own unique set of things to work through. Um, I think I see, I tend to see a, a few themes um, one would be, you know, on, on that self-awareness on the side of being a good person, as I like to put it, um, there are ways to measure that. There are ways to get better at that, you know, um, not just saying, oh, I am morally and ethically a good person, but being perceived that way, um, gets into how we connect with other people and our body language 
and our our communication skills. You can assess that and you can improve it. A lot of musicians will think, well, I did my part in the practice room (laughs) and I I think I talk clearly. Why don't people like me? Why don't they want to hire me? Why don't they want to sleep on top of me in a tour bus, you know? Um, So I think that is a really big hurdle, but also the playing side, I think uh, we talk, not you and I, but we collectively talk so often about the chops required for the gig and we skip over a lot of the other things that are just as important with playing. Um, technical knowledge, you know, actually having the expertise to know what goes on in the kind of show that you see yourself being a part of. Uh, a lot of drummers will say, oh man, I got all the chops and I can play all those parts. Why am I not on the gig? And it's like, well, do you know how to run that tracks show file? <laughs> because if you didn't notice that drummer is also running that you, you couldn't, do that job Um, or something like, um, you know, having the right touch, the right sort of feel for a position, things like that. There are so many factors. And I think people have a tendency to oversimplify and say, can you literally play it? And are you not a jerk? Well, you should be there. And it's like, you know, there's actually so much more subtlety here Um, because there's not one way to do it in the music business, right? You've got how many genres of music you've got, how many different artists and, and opportunities out there at any given moment. It really is. How aware are you of where you fit? Yeah. Well, and if, if you're not aware of that yet, we shouldn't be saying, why don't I have an opportunity? You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, I, I think there's, you know, two, we, we, I think as drummers, you know, and I'll boil it down to just our crowd here. You know, I think as drummers, we, we tend to measure ourselves against other drummers, right? Like we, we just live in that society where, you know, I, I'll be scrolling through Instagram and I'll see Tommy, I go, and I'm just like, Holy crap, man, I'll never be able to do that. Well, maybe that's not the guy I should be comparing myself against. Right. <laughs> Somebody that's mm. that's been playing at that high level for 45 years. Right. Um, you know, so I think we we fall into that rabbit hole a bit of comparing ourselves to others when we should really just be focusing on ourselves. Um, you know, then there's the other piece, you know, and, and I have a personal, you know, experience with the look the part piece of it. Right. Um, I played with a a young country artist that will remain unnamed um, who was just coming out of the gate strong. He's doing really well down in Nashville now. Um, And he had some management um, that was really interested in him, came to one of the shows that I played. And I basically got told, you know, I've had gray hair since I was 20 years old. And I was basically told, hey, man, you look 20 years older than the artist. You should dye your hair. And I, my response was, the reason I look 20 years older than the artist is because I am. <laughs> 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 and I'm not going to dye my hair for a gig. I mean, it's just not something that, that I wanted to do, right? But mm-hmm. – Maybe I could have said, okay, I'll go get a box of just for men and I might still be doing that gig. I don't know. But I I think, you you know, there's all these different things. And to your point, not one path is going to be the right path for everybody. Um, And, you know, I I hate to keep harping on the whole self-awareness thing, um, you know, but it never dawned on me that my gray hair may be a problem for any gig I would ever play. Right. So I I lack some self-awareness there. And, and yet uh, if I could play devil's advocate, it sounds like for you, a gig that is an authentic match for you is one where the color of your hair doesn't matter. Correct. I mean, that's just, you know, that's a line that, you know, a hill that I'm willing to die on, I suppose, but yeah, uh, you know, which is fine. And I don't have any hard feelings. I don't wish any ill will anywhere, but I was completely shocked by that request. It wasn't like, Mm -hmm. Hey hey man, you were rushing the third chorus in the fourth song. It wasn't my playing. It was, you look too old for the artist. Well, maybe I am. 
you're right. So uh, yeah, I, I just find it amazing to me that the business is what it is and all of these things that we have to adapt to as individual players um, to find the right fit. And I think that's part of it too, right? Absolutely. And, and one of my goals with putting something out there in this way was to help with, you know, what I hear implicit in your voice is um, you are comfortable with saying something isn't for you. Yes. And that's, that's not seen as, as um, a detriment. That is actually a good thing because you have clarity about what's for me, what's not for me. And one of the things that I was really careful, you know, if I'm going to design a tool for people, I want to make sure it's actually serving everybody well. So hopefully someone has more clarity about what they should stop either pushing for or kicking themselves over or worrying about or, you know, that sense of what's for me and what's not. Wait, wait, wait. If it's not for you, it's for. Hold on. I don't mean to interrupt, but are you telling me I'm never going to get the Motley Crue gig? Is that what you're telling me here, Mark? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I've never, I've never um, been in their management meeting, so I don't know what they're <laughs> looking for next. <laughs> but, but I mean, if you think about it, don't, don't a lot of people walk around with this sense that, oh, if you had the chops, you could get any gig you want. Yes. I, I, I see and, it every day. And it's, it's really detached from reality in the music business of there's actually only a couple people in the running for any given opportunity. Yeah. So, that highlights the importance of, of getting to know what are the ones that are where I belong, because those are the ones that I need to be completely focused on. And all of my development, whether it's playing skill or, or personal growth or whatever, needs to be aligned with, you know, really honing the person that gets that gig. Because you can't simultaneously be wanting to play with, uh, you know, like Paul Simon and Motley Crue. <laughs> right. Probably not going to work out too well for you. That's for sure. I, I guess the the next thing that I'm curious about is, you know, how much of it is a, a, a and I'm not trying to sound like the old guy yelling at a cloud, right? And get off my lawn and all that. But I hear a lot of young players, younger than me anyway, that will say things like, you know, but I don't want to start out riding in a van for $300 a week. Like, you know, I, there's this prevalent theme of pay your dues in this business. And I think so many people are like, I just don't want to do that. It, is it still a requirement? I don't know because I haven't been in those shoes for a lot of years, but you know, I think hard work, you're just going to have to put it in, right? Yeah. I, I, um, it's a difficult question because simultaneously I would say, yeah, you're always going to have to pay your dues. Um, but there's not a universally agreed upon set of dues. To uh, yeah, very true. You know, so the, the person that says, and I've, I've met some of these too, you know, I just don't want to do X, Y, and Z. I don't want to go through that. And I'm, I say, cool. Well, that gives you a lot of clarity about what you should not be focusing on. You're, you're, you know, you're the master of your own destiny here. You can absolutely write off all those things, but you have to accept that by extension, you're writing off these other things that you're claiming you want. So there might be something to reconcile there. Like what, what do you really want? The, the, the core question uh, behind a lot of things, a lot of conversations like this. Um, but paying your dues, if you're doing the right things in a lane that is authentic to you, you shouldn't feel that bad. Um, I don't know about you. Like when, when you uh, think back to your time touring and that you would describe as your time paying your dues, uh, how would you say that it felt? Oh, I, I mean, I look back now, you know, through that 25 year lens and those were the greatest days of my life. You know, it was more, exactly. more fun than I could you know, purchase legally now, you know, but at the time it was just what you had to do. Right. Yep. I mean, I mean and it, you were willing to do what you had to do. Of course. You know, I mean, I can't tell you I, the number of times where it was like, 
you pull into Taco Bell and you order six tacos and everybody gets one because that's all you could afford. Right. I mean, it's but I look back on that now and I'm like, God, that's what, you know, forged our band in iron, you know, like having yeah. to, that, that collective experience. Um, so that, that was, that was my rock band. Um, I was in a rock band called ghost of Gloria for five years. And, and yeah, we toured in the van. Nobody got paid anything except a $20 a day per diem. Yeah. And that was it. That was all we had, which meant, Back in the day, it was two $5 footlongs and like a convenience store breakfast. And you might have money for like a dollar beer at showtime. That was it. And that was not even remotely a sacrifice at the time. It was totally worth it. Uh, Was it easy or cool? No, but it wasn't a problem. Uh, If it was a problem, I wouldn't have been a good fit for that band. I I probably would have become a cancer in the band and jeopardized the whole thing. Um, so having that idea, I feel like it's a good thing. If somebody really knows something, I don't want this. Um, who am I to tell you, you have to do it. You probably don't want this. <laughs> right. And, and, and maybe, maybe that's enough to shake them out of an unrealistic expectation. If they think, you know, maybe they think a music career is going to make them a ton of money or something. Um, sometimes people, when they're just confronted with that reality of, well, maybe you don't want to be a professional musician then if you're not willing to go through this condition or, or that experience. Uh, sometimes they'll adjust and sometimes they won't and they go on to whatever career actually better suited them. Yeah. Um, but I, I, think, I think the paying of dues is something that flows from that grind when you are in the right space and in the right place, you know, in your authentic journey. And your dues wouldn't have felt right to me perhaps. And mine wouldn't have felt right to you because you'd be like, yeah, but I'm willing to do this, but not with this band. You yeah. know, I'm willing to do this, but, but not at this point in my life, things right. like that. Right. And, and I think, um, that's what separates the people that keep on a path from those that say, yeah, no, no way, no way. That's not worth it. The people that stick it out realize that whatever they're giving up is a worthy trade off. Well, and I think what's appropriate for a 21 year old, you know, may not be appropriate for a, a, a 45 year old. Right. I mean, of course. so, you know, if, if I look from where I sit today and somebody said, hey, you've got to go back to when you were 21 and have those same experiences again, I'd be like, you're out of your damn mind. There's no way I would do it now. Right. But of course. Yeah. But at the time it was fine whatever I need to do. I'm chasing this thing. Right. So, um, I, I just think the mindset going into it, um, you know, and again, I don't want to sound like an old man, you know, yelling at the kids to, to stay off my lawn, but you can't just, I, I, I guess, approach this business as though something is owed to you. You have to go prove oh, yeah. that it's owed to you. Right. You got to go oh, yeah. earn the stuff. Yeah. And that, that would get into, if I saw somebody with, with that sort of air about them, that it's owed to you. Um, I would, all my alarm bells for what I would call step three, be a good person would be going off. It's, it would be, it would be saying, okay, you, what sort of unique thing do you have here that entitles you to this? are you not connected authentically to other people? You know, that's one way that people could easily think that we're a jerk if we're just not connected authentically to them. Um, can you carry on a conversation and not be, you know, self-centered? Yeah. Can you support someone else? Can you, um, whatever that is in the moment, um, if somebody that feels like something's owed to them is going to be missing the mark in so many of those areas. And yeah, they're probably not going to get that opportunity because it actually wasn't about the riding in a van. It was the fact that maybe they had some personal work to do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, I mean, some of our mutual friends, I mean, you know, I I think of guys like, you know, Ray Luzier, who is one of the, you know, baddest dudes alive behind a drum set. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's been playing in corn for many years. Uh, you know, some people forget that, you know, he used to play with David Lee Roth, 
right? When he was a young cat. I doubt Ray would leave corn to go back to David Lee Roth. I just think that there's a, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think there, you know, I'm not taking anything away from either of those artists. I'm just saying there's a natural sequence of things that happen in this business. Um, yeah. with, whether by design or by sheer dumb luck, there's a progression, right? Yes. Yes. And, and where you are in your career and in, in stage of life and all that, um, you have to represent that authentically, right? That's part of what says that, that this gig is right for you now. Maybe it wasn't right for you before, or maybe it will be right for somebody in 10 years. You know, they haven't grown into it, so to speak yet. Um, I think for everybody, like just taking stock of right now with me, what, what is an authentic fit that can, that alone can be an eye opening process because, Speaking, you know, for myself as a father now, man, the the calculus of trade off on things is a totally different process. Oh yeah. And other things that would have been dream opportunities a handful of years ago would not even be considered now. Yeah. And other things that I would have brushed off years ago, perhaps I would be really looking at with interest. And you know, one was a fit for, you know, the mark of, of 2018 or 2015. And one's going to be a fit for the mark of 2024. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but we, we are who we are at each moment, you know, cause we're not, we're not like one fixed unchanging thing at any point, no matter how much us drummers like to think of ourselves that way sometimes I think, but, um, we're going to keep changing. Yeah. And I, you have to adapt to what's going on you know, in the business, so to speak, too. And, and you know, I, I'm not just trying to name drop here, but, you know, that younger country artist that I was talking about, you know, we did a show with, you know, opening up for a, a bigger country artist, and I immediately recognized the drummer. And he was somebody that had played in a gigantic rock band in the late 90s. And, you know, here he was playing clubs with a kind of up and coming country artist. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, kind of confidential here, but I was like, Hey, you know, what's, what are you doing in this gig? And he was like, it's a gig, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. he was like, when, yeah. the, when the record deal went away, it's like, you find a job and this is my job. And he killed it played a brilliant yep. show and it was amazing, but you have to, I think I know. Yeah, I'm sure you sorry, do. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say that anyone else who, who might be thinking they know who you're talking about. He's one of my favorite players in town. I'll, I'll just say that I won't, I won't give it away either, but um, a great example for just, man, you show up for the moment that you're in. You don't show up for the past and you don't show up for the future. You show up for the moment that you're in. And what a great example of somebody that has every box checked. You yes. know, they're not saying, oh, I deserve this, or I shouldn't be here, or, or any sort of thing that doesn't belong in the moment. They, sh they show up for where they're at and kill it every time. And every time I see him play, he makes me want to play. Yes. Which is like, that's, that's my metric for, um, you know, the service one musician should provide another. Like if, if, if you say, Oh, I saw this guy and it makes me want to quit. That's a bad thing. If we, we should all be making each other want to play. <laughs> right. I can't wait to go home and, 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 and see my drums and be around music after seeing certain people play. And I think it's that joy, that complete acceptance of, of the moment and saying, you know, this is good too. This isn't bad. It's not, it's not, Oh, a downward spiral or, or that was the up and this is the down. It's like, man, this is the evolution. And, and that, this particular player, he continues to go on a ride and it's no surprise because he's going to keep getting calls as long as he wants to get calls. Because yes. like I said, he always shows up in the moment. That's, that's exactly right. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I think you and I talked about this in a previous episode and, you know, I'm always bagging on, you know, Brown Eyed Girl and Brick House and, you know, all those songs that we've all played a billion times but if that's the gig you're on today, play Brown Eyed Girl like your life depends on it because it could lead to the next big step in your career. And yeah, I, 
I don't know what it is, but it took me a very, very long time to figure that out. And the other aspect to that too, that, you know, it, it can, you know, borderline existential, but add gravity to the importance of the moment is who are you to know that you're going to get to do this again? That's right. You know, it, it could be the last time, man, I, especially with what we, we just spent that time in, in the beginning talking about the pandemic, man, we don't know. We have no idea what is in store. And I would want the last time I got to sit down to play, be good. You know, not doesn't have to be the greatest, doesn't have to have been the biggest gig with the, you know, the most pay or like, you know, none of that. I just want it to be good. I want to be able to say, yeah, man, I showed up. That was me. I played, I I gave Mark poise to that moment um, because it would be too much of a bummer to have to say anything else. Yeah. Well, I mean, nobody picks a good time for their career to end, right? (laughs) I mean, like not everybody can go out opening for the stones in a stadium, right? That that can't be everybody's last gig. And, you know, so I, I just think, You know, you know this, and I've told you this. You are one of my favorite human beings, Mark. You're just such a smart guy, and you go about everything with such a pure heart, and you genuinely want to help everybody you come in contact with. And let me just say, as your friend, thank you for being that. Um, You're every time I talk to you, I always feel better after having done so. So there's there's a magic there. Um, and Man, thank you. You're very welcome. And that's sincere. I mean that so, so much. You're, you're a good friend to me. And, um, you know, I, I want to kind of circle back a little bit to say if, you know, if we have listeners listening in on our drum hang here who want to check out the course, you know, Give me some chapter and verse on what they need to do, you know, how it all works and and where they can find it. So I'm going to make you be the marketing executive now. Sure. Sure. Yeah, no problem. I, um, Jamie, I can't tell you uh, what that means to me hearing that from you. And uh, I want to tell you, you know, it's, it's just been a privilege to be connected to you all the years now that we have been connected. I know we were talking about that before we pressed record today. Um, but as far as the course goes, um, I, it's available online. Um, it's available at courses.markpoise.com. Um, and you can, if you ever have trouble spelling my name, I'm easy to find wherever you might, might look me up. Fortunately, there's not a lot of Mark Poises in the world. Um, but it is, it's set up like a series of video modules that somebody would go through and then a series of assessments. So by breaking it down into three components, the, the beauty of simplicity is then we have a very systematic way we can go about assessing things. So somebody's going to have about 68, 70 minutes of videos to watch, but that's actually not the meat of it. The meat of it is what people will uncover on their own when they use each assessment. Um, some of these are self-assessment. Some of these you're going to be leveraging other people for. Um, getting the right feedback from the right direction is key. And then what they're going to do throughout the process is build that clear picture of where can I grow most next from here? Um, And then also I take, you know, later in the course, the opportunity to crack open some doors on some personal uh, development things, some next steps for people um, alluding to some barriers that show up down the road. You know, I mean, there's some people that get everything they ever wanted in music and they're still not happy. Um, and not spending a lot of time on those, but cracking some doors open, um, just trying to give every opportunity for someone to get the boost that they need in whatever area. Um, but it's all about building awareness and then you turn that awareness into action in a personal way rather than, Oh, you know, this person said I should do this. That person said I should do that. This is actually specific. You'll know I need to do this because this is what the data says. Uh, if I do this, I'm going to be that much closer. So it's a process that somebody wouldn't go through in an hour. You could watch all the videos in an hour and 10 minutes or so, but it's probably going to be weeks, maybe even months for someone to really go through the process the way it was designed. 
Um, and I, I made sure that it's a, a sort of living and breathing course. So somebody that signs up now, they'll be able to see updates as they're made. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to talk about sourcing feedback from other people if I wasn't willing to do it myself. So I'm going to keep adding to it. And uh, if there are oversights, obviously they'll, they'll get corrected, but hopefully it'll also be evolving and adapting as the industry evolves. And uh, it's not just for drummers also. So for all musicians, making sure that I um, share things from a perspective and with a depth that suits anyone in the music business. Um, that's all important to me. So they can find it all, like I said, courses.markpoise.com. And, um, and they'll also be able to have a direct line to me. You know, it is something that would pair well with a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship, although that's not required in any way. Um, but some people have already used it as that. And we've been able to do a deep dive, you know, sort of taking people forward um, with what their findings are. But it's designed to be something that could be standalone for for somebody that already has a lot of clarity and maybe just be that boost to confidence for certain people that end up realizing, Hey, you know, it hasn't happened yet, but this, this shows me I, I am there and this is possible. And now I know I just need to keep it up. I just need to sustain this effort um, because the opportunity will come. Um, so uh, like I said, I, I believe in, in trying to help, people as much as I can in a personal way. Uh, and I love that you get that. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you get that because it's really the most important thing. Yeah, man, it really is. And, you know, we're, we're only here for a finite amount of time and, you know, I, I don't want to sound crass, but just being a, a, a dickhead or, you know, a gatekeeper because you can be, what does that really get you? You know what I mean? Like, like, that doesn't do anything for you help each other out there. You know, I mean, um, I, I can't, you know, begin to, to list the people that have helped me along my way. And when somebody says, Hey, I've got this tool that will help you. Um, you should definitely check it out. That's, that's my, <laughs> you know, that's my approach on it. Um, because none of us know everything and it's, it's really hard. And, one of the things that, you know, one of the running themes of this podcast has always been, you know, how do you take control of your career? Let's face it, as a drummer, most of the time we're sidemen, you know, we're hired guns. Um, how do you take control of your career? How can you, as a drummer, not be beholden to the next time your artist is going on tour? How can you make scratch when they're at home raising a family or, you know, they they took up motorcycle racing or, or whatever the case may be? That stuff happens. Do you have to scramble to find another gig or is there something else? As you say, I've got the tools to do something else. Let me explore it. And, you know, you are a prime example of that. You know, you've you've expanded your palette, so to speak, other than just being a drummer to go on tour with, right? You have all these things to offer. And I think it's a testament to how you take control of your career, how you sustain yourself and how you help others. And man, you know, like I like to say, that's where the juice is. That's the good stuff mm -hmm. in life. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the powerful thing for me was, shifting the idea of what I do. It used to, you know, when I was a lot younger, it used to be, oh, I want to play drums and I'm a drummer and I play drums for people and blah, 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 you know? And through, you know, the, just the transformation of, of life experience and really a lot of the most difficult points of my life, I started to realize that, no, man, it's not about the drums and it's not about music. The, I, it's always been feeling like a service to people. And music has always meant so much to me that that's why playing it for others felt like a service to them. And so everything else that I've been doing, I, I came to see it as I'm doing more of the same thing. It's a service to people. And because I feel good doing that, um, that's, that's really the, the, the purpose. So it's just as authentic to sit down behind a kit and do what I love to do there as it is to do these other things now. Um, because that is where my authenticity is, is the intersection of all those things. Um, 
and not that everyone should be that because that's just my combo. Um, every single person that can realize that, you know what, drums are this and I, and I also love guitar and writing and singing songs, or I also love, I don't know, being a doctor, you know, there, there's plenty of those, um, whatever it is for each of us and figuring out like, Hey, I am all these things together and it can serve the whole in all these different ways. Um, that can give the courage to do the hard, the, you know, the hard tasks that are on the way. Yeah, man. And again, that's where the juice is. <laughs> when you, yeah. when you figure that stuff out, it makes a, a, a huge difference. And, and I know this is a little different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an episode for some of my crowd because you know some of it's philosophical and i get that but at the end of the day i think people listen to me blather on with these incredible guests to learn something either about what makes you know simon phillips tick what is he thinking about when he's writing that stuff right or you know what was the path that you know, Marco Miniman followed to make it in the business. Um, so this is a little bit of an extrapolation on that, but I, I just think that everybody needs to fully explore what their capabilities are and take it as far as you can or as far as you want to. Um, that's my goal for everybody that listens to this show is chase the dream while you have a dream, right? Don't don't look back at 80 years old and be like, boy, I wish I had taken that gig riding in the van for $300 a week, right? If you can do it, do it. Yeah. And chase your dream, not chasing somebody else's dream or the one you saw, you know, back in the days of VH1 behind the music. Like what is yours and whatever weird combo of stuff that are in the picture for that, I mean, you've mentioned some of the drummers you just mentioned with Marco and Simon, totally unique paths. They weren't trying to be somebody else along the way. That's right. And that's important. And that's, yeah, that, that, and that's, that's the, the seed of their success was not trying to be what someone else had been. They just got a sense of, hey, this is me. The, 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 and in some, sometimes that's a really interesting uh, maybe even nonsensical combination of things, but for an individual, it makes perfect sense. And gosh, please do that. You know, anyone who gets that kind of clarity, please do it because I love the stuff that Marco has done. You know, I love like Simon is, is a literal giant in our world. Yes. You know, um, we would be so much worse off if any one of them hadn't done what they did. And it's just as important for any other person. You know, if, if you feel in the pull in a certain direction, uh, you know, call it philosophy if you like, but that's the kind of philosophy I, I think is always worth exploring. Absolutely. Because you can't, you can't go redo things. That's exactly right, man. It's, it's just so good. But, you, you know, I, I don't have to tell you this. It's an open door policy here. Anytime you have anything you want to talk about, say the word. We will put you on this show because I always learn so much talking to you. And I, I know my crowd loves hearing from you as well. So we're going to send some folks your way for sure. Um, but keep us posted on everything that's going on. And I'll share updates as, uh, you know, as you give them to me uh, with our crowd. But, man, thanks so much for the time and coming on and and having another cool drum hang with me. Thank you so much, Jamie. It, it, it's an honor to come into your house here, uh, so to speak, and, and to be welcomed and w be a tiny little sliver of, of the awesome community that you've created. Um, I, I consider myself just super fortunate. Thank you. Oh, man, thank you. I'll talk to you real soon, okay, brother? Yeah. All right, thanks, buddy. All right, guys and girls, that's going to wrap up episode 155 of the Drum Shuffle podcast. As always, a million thanks to Mark for taking time out of his busy schedule, uh, you know, between tour dates to come on and talk with us. I always get so much out of it, and um, I, I'm always so motivated after I talk to Mark. He is uh, a great way to recharge your batteries, so to speak. And I know he'll get a kick out of me saying that. So thanks, Mark, for taking time to come back on the Drum Shuffle podcast. 
Uh, folks always ask me, hey, how can I help the podcast? The biggest thing you can do is share a link with a friend. And we appreciate your efforts around that. Uh, you know, hit the thumbs up button, uh, leave us a star rating, a review on whatever platform you use to listen to the podcast. It helps us as we continue to grow. Uh, and we are still continuing to grow, which is a great thing. I really appreciate the uh, all of you listeners that have helped us form a community around this little uh, fiercely independent podcast that we run. So I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for that. We answer every single email that we get here at the podcast. Uh, the email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the drum shuffle.com. And you can always find more information about the craziness in my life over at Jamie Uh, you're going to want to make sure you hit the subscribe button for the podcast because next week we're going to be joined by the great Nick D Virgilio. Uh, most of you are going to know him from his time in Spock's Beard, Tears for Fears, Genesis. Um, he is uh, head of percussion marketing at Sweetwater uh, and just announced he is going on a world tour uh, as the drummer in Mr. Big this year. So don't you don't want to miss that, I promise. Uh, guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening. We cannot do this without each and every one of you doing so. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.